Uh, good afternoon, everyone, again. <laughs> I'm Yoji Kojima from Saito Group. The title of my talk is Decoding the Keys of Our Life Cycle. My story starts from here. Uh, this is the photo of baby crocodile and baby elephant and one-year-old baby. Cute? Yes? Thanks, it's my son. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, so not only these vertebrates, but also most of the multicellular organism in Earth starts from one single cell. That is the fertilized egg. And this fertilized egg is the fusion of the male germ cells, which is the sperm, and the female germ cells, which is the egg. And as you know, the largest egg existing in this world is the ostrich egg which is sometimes 15 centimeters in diameter and weighs over one kilogram. But actually, the cell body itself is quite tiny, as small as the human egg on the right-hand side, which is about 100 micrometer in diameter. And so starting from this cell, the baby grows inside mother's uterus until they are ready to come outside to live in the outside world. So how this happens? So this, is, this shows the uh, human embryo development process of the first eight weeks. And you can see the shape of the embryo quickly changes within this eight week. And by this eight weeks, um, it still is like five centimeter long, but it already has the shape of the human. And did anyone notice the white dot in here? And this is the size of the fertilized egg in the same scale. So you can see how quickly the cells proliferate and differentiate to form the human body. Isn't it amazing that this complex process is occurring without mistakes? Actually, we do mis sometimes mistakes, and these mistakes will cause the birth defects. The major birth defects that is known is like cleft lip or cleft palate, which is the defect in uh, fusion of the facial structure in the midline. And others are like heart anomaly, which is the defect in the formation of cardiac chambers or uh, defect in tube connections. And there are others, such as Down syndrome, which is caused by having abnormal chromosome numbers. Actually, these birth defects are seen in around 3 to 5% of all the newborn babies, which is quite a lot. That means there are at least one or two patients in one classroom in the school. And it is known that around a quarter of them are coming from the germ cells, the parent, from the parents, which is like the genetic mutations or the abnormal cell chromosome counts as seen in Down syndrome. So it's this many, but actually no one knows how it happens and what is the mechanisms of these diseases. How can we leave this unchallenged? So this is the first one of the objectives of, objectives of my study. Can we prevent birth defects? To do this, as I mentioned before, some of the birth defects are coming from the germ cells of the parents. So we need to know how and when the germ cells are formed in our body. So I will show you the life cycle of the human, starting from the fertilized egg. So this fertilized egg, uh, after several cleavages, it forms a cavity inside, and the uh, it is separated into two distinct lineages. The outer cells are forming the future placenta. And the red cells, which is the epiblast, forms the entire body parts. And the placenta lineage will never form the cells in the, epi uh, cells in the body. And this epiblast, within two or three weeks after fertilization, forms a disc-like structure. And at this stage, at the posterior side of the epiblast, the first cells of the germ cell lineage is formed, which is called primordial germ cells. And I will mention this as PGCs in the rest of my talk. So these PGCs, after they are formed, they migrate inside our body to the lower abdominal part, 
and further differentiate. And then during puberty, they get fully maturated, and then we can make sperms or eggs to form our offsprings. So we know where they are during the embryo development, but this process is largely unknown. We don't know what molecule is doing what uh, to form these germ cells. So I hide this part in a black box. So think this situation as a black box, like uh, you don't know what is inside, and it is tightly locked. So how can we open this? So there are several reasons that we couldn't approach inside this black box. So obviously, we cannot study human embryo because they are living inside mother's body. And also, um, the limited number of PGCs in the embryos is another reason. And furthermore, we don't have any experimental models Experimental model means, for example, if we are studying the functions in cancer cells, we sometimes have the cell culture system that we can culture the cells in a plastic plate. And by adding some molecules, or we can test what happens with those cells with various conditions. And we don't have that kind of system with germ cell development. So how can we do this? We first asked the mouse. This is the experimental organism that we commonly use. Well, let's study how the mouse life cycle is going. It's quite similar to human system. It starts from the sperms and eggs, and when they get fertilized, they, further, uh, they start growing. And then the epiblast is formed, and af after that, within a couple of days, the first lineage of germ cells, uh, first cells of the germ cell lineage is formed, the PGCs. And those cells migrate to the posterior side of the embryo and then give birth. And you can see, as I mentioned before, human epiblast has a disc-like structure, while mouse epiblast is like a cup-like structure. So it implies that the signaling events that happens in this stage may be different from mouse and human. But anyway, we started doing this with human, uh, mouse. The problem is, even with mouse, until recently, we didn't know what is inside. So um, we needed to know how to decode the system. The reason why we couldn't understand the mechanisms of germ cell development in, in mice is that one of the reasons is the PGC population is quite small. There are only 20 to 40 cells in the embryo at this stage. Recent advance in technology allows us to do various analyses in single cells now, but still, Many functional analyses require thousands of cells, and sometimes we need millions of cells. It's not realistic to harvest like thousands of embryos for just one assay. So the question is, how can we increase our materials? So one of the answer is the use of ES cells or IPS cells. As you know, ES cells are derived from the embryo, and the IPS cells are reprogrammed from differentiated tissue. And there are two distinct characteristics within these cells. Uh, these cells. And one of the characteristics is the self-renewal. That means they can grow almost indefinitely in plastic plate. And furthermore, it happens without changing its characteristics. And the second is the pluripotency. Pluripotency means that they can differentiate into any kinds of cells in our body. So uh, the, this ES cells and IPS cells are quite similar to the epiblast cells in our embryo. So back to this black box situation, 
uh, instead of having this huge black box in between the epiblast and the germ cells, we might be able to break down into more simpler questions if we start from the ES cells or the IPS cells. The reason is we can track the cellular change, uh, track the cellular response to various kinds of molecules at any time we want because it is outside of the body. And also we can do the live imaging so that we can exactly know how the cells are going to change. So uh, if we want to start from ES cells or IPS cells, we can decode one by one of the whole system. But to do that, we need to know how the cells differentiate. The cell fate determination step is usually illustrated like this, a ball rolling down a hill. And when a signal comes in to the cell, it rolls down. And the color of the cells in here is coming different. And the important thing is that once the cell rolled down to become the blue cells, it cannot go back to the red cells or the green cells. And this is actually ha what is happening in our body. For example, assuming that the purple cell on the top is the fertilized egg, the placenta lineage first comes apart from the rest, and then comes the germ cells. And the remaining cell is the epiblast cells, which can differentiate into all other parts of our body. And this kind of signal and differentiation step continues furthermore and until the cells get further uh, the terminally differentiated state. So if we can identify each signaling that is driving the cells to any kind of cells, uh, any kind of lineage, then we can drive the ES cells or IPS cells down to any of the lineages. So back to mouse life cycle, instead of starting from the epiblast, uh, we started from ES cells and combining all the knowledge we have from the literatures and combining all the knowledge of the genetic expression profile of the early stage of embryo, at last we could make the PGC-like cells from the ES cells, both from male origin or female origin. And to test the function of these PGC-like cells, we, inject, we transplanted these cells back to mice. And from those mice, we could make the eggs and sperms. And by using those eggs and sperms, they could be fertilized and could make the offsprings. So uh, we cleared the first hurdle of the germ cell specification step in mouse system. And now, because we only had 20 to 40 cells at the early stage of PGC specification, we can easily prepare even millions of cells with using this system. By using this system, we can now analyze what the molecular mechanism is for the PGC specification. And how about in human? That is my interest. Human ES cells and IPS cells is known to have similar characteristics with the epiblast of the early embryo. But it is known that it is quite different from mouse ES cells. Mouse ES cells are regarded to be more sort of naive state, and human is regarded as Development, developmentally advanced. So the signaling requirement is different. And also, I mentioned before, PG, when the PGC is specified in the embryo, the shape of the epiblast is completely different. So we need to adjust the signaling. The, we need to tune them so that the cells can acquire the PGC lineage 
with several trials and errors, we finally made it. So starting from human iPS cells, we could make this human PGC-like cells. So in human life cycle, we are at this stage. We could make this PGC-like cells from the human iPS cells. But this is still the entrance of the huge black box. So we now know how to differentiate the iPS cells to become this PGC-like state, but we don't know the underlying molecular mechanisms of it, like what molecule is in doing what or what gene is transcribed. So that's what we are ta tackling now. And if we can push this a little further, we can provide a platform to study the, mole uh, the molecular mechanisms of germ cell maturation step, which is a crucial period uh, to understand how the birth defects occurs. So to summarize, uh, we are trying to decode this black box, which you can see it's slightly open now, but this black box hides the reason for the birth defect. And we are trying to open this by the use of human iPS cells. And once we can decode this, then we might be able to study the mechanisms of those birth defects. And someday we may be able to provide the prevention of the birth defects, or in some cases, we may be able to treat them. That's the end of my talk. Thank you so much.